Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 14th, 2009. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Chris Colby, editor of Brew Your Own Magazine, brings us up to date on his efforts to grow and malt his own barley. Plus, he tells us about a hop experiment he's starting to deal with the Texas heat. And we'll talk about an article in the upcoming BYO magazine on corking Belgian beers. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And you can follow me on Twitter. My username, Basic Brewing, all one word. And you can find me on the Facebook, too. My username there is Basic Brewing James. And we also have a Basic Brewing radio and video page on Facebook. And if you become a fan of the show there, I'll be uh, sending out occasional notices when shows are posted. Uh, Also, while I'm plugging away, we have our Brewer's Logbooks in stock still, just a few. And also, thanks to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our BasicBrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you the show, and we appreciate your support. Also, 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 we have a, a associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine uh, and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. The deadline for submitting your data for the Basic Brewing Radio Brew Your Own Magazine Collaborative Experiment is this Friday. Don't forget, and thanks to everybody who's already sent in your stuff. Very interesting. Can't wait to see how it all comes together. Uh, Looking at homebrew legislation news, there are two reasons to celebrate this week. Mark Emily from Washington State wrote last Wednesday, just wanted to let you know that today Governor... uh, Gregoire, Greg, oh, the governor, signed Senate Bill 5060 into law, which will make transportation of homemade beer and wine out of the house of production for private use legal in Washington, starting on July 26th, we think, Mark says. Raise a pint to celebrate freeing the homebrew. Indeed. Uh, and I received that news a little too late to put on last week, but we're, we're glad to glad to air it this week. I also heard from a Tom Schmidlin, former Beer Drinker of the Year, who says a few of us went down for the signing and met the governor briefly. The new law should take effect in a couple of months. So for those out there who live in states where it is illegal to brew or where they don't like the existing laws, don't give up. Good advice, Tom. Awesome news from Washington. Congratulations to Oaha members and all home brewers in that state. Also, Tuesday of this week, May 12th, marked the first day that home brewers in Utah could legally practice their hobby. I wrote uh, to Douglas Warzynski to see if he was taking advantage of the new legality, and he was. Douglas said, uh, I'm loving the weather and, f- and the feeling of being a free and clear legal brewer. Sarah and I took the day off and work, and I have a brew going as I type. I decided in honor of the successful legislative effort that was proof positive of the beauty of a constitutional democracy, I'd pick up a recipe that honored the founding fathers. Last week, I dug into the BBR archives, found the Poor Richard's Ale episode, scribbled some notes from the show, adapted the recipe to my brewing desires, and voila! Since uh, getting others to join me for a uh, weekday brew day was a hard sell, Douglas says Sarah and I have decided to host a homebrew happy hour to celebrate further Utah Legalization Day. I sent an email to some brewing friends and posted something on Facebook inviting friends who want to raise a glass in celebration to stop by after work for a charcoal grilled hot dog or hamburger and a glass of legal homebrew. It is a great day to be a brewer. How exciting. Congratulations again to Douglas and everybody else who worked so hard to get that law passed. Amazing stuff, and I couldn't be happier for everybody in Utah, all the homebrewers over there. Well, on that pas- uh, positive note, pa- or positive note, depending on where you live, let's take a peek into the mailbag. John from Old Orchard, Maine. It's probably positive up there in Maine. Uh, writes, I recently bought a three-tiered all-grain setup. I'm on my third batch. 
The first one I brewed with the guy that I bought it from. It came out great. I've brewed two batches since, and each time I had a huge boil over. I'm using a converted keg, and I'm only brewing five gallons. What am I doing wrong? I'm a bit concerned as I'm planning a 10-gallon batch. Well, John, learning to deal with the taming the boil over or getting a hold of it before it happens is an important and sometimes tricky skill, depending on your system. Some find that having a fan blow directly on the top of the wort helps a lot. It kind of helps even the heat there because I think what happens is the, the wort gets superheated there and it uh, gets out of control. But uh, I find that uh, watching the wort closely as it approaches the boil, you know, you can tell it starts to get a little bigger. And uh, once it once the boil starts to come on, I shut down the heat and uh, add in ingredients that I need and then ease the heat back on and kind of stir it around and kind of ease it back into the boil state. And what you want to do is get the wort all evened out temperature-wise. Once you get that happening... Then it'll stabilize, and you can get a nice rolling boil, and you can uh, not watch it so closely. But uh, that's my technique, shutting off the heat, sneaking it back on. Um, it's especially tricky if you're adding a lot of hops or extract into the boil at that, at that time. So uh, at that time, you probably want the heat off completely and uh, add those ingredients and then gradually bring it back on. However... I got another email from uh, Tim in Minnesota who says, Recently a guest stated that by adding hops prior to the boil, he could eliminate boilovers. Tim says, I just tried it, and he was right. I have a split batch, one with plugs and one with pellets. I have the water within an inch of the top of the kettle and the lid within an inch of being fully on, which is also very tricky. And the gas is on full blast. No boil over. Well, there you go. You might want to try that. Try that yourself. That's another approach. You can add ingredients before the boil comes up. There's no there's no saying that you have to wait until the uh, the water is full boiling before you add the extract, for instance. So you can add your ingredients before the boil comes up. Uh, you still have to watch it. You still have to be careful. But uh, that helps a lot. Also, having the lid, I don't use the lid. The only the, the only time recently that I've had a boil over is when I put the lid on or, or partially on near the end of the boil. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what I was doing. It might have been raining a little bit. Anyway, uh, once you once you get that all that steam trapped, it seems to cause me some problems at least. Anyway, uh, so whatever method you use just takes a bit of practice, John to get used to what you, your system requires and avoiding the boil over. But uh, once you get that boil established, uh, even subtle tweaks on the heat can, can make a big difference in the level of that boil. So it just takes a little practice. You'll get, you'll get a hang of it. Hang in there, John. Now, uh, and, and if you have some, some tips or techniques on avoiding the boil over, send them in. We will share them. Now, Chris Colby has a lot going on in his yard. If you saw the Basic Brewing video episode that we shot at his house, you could see that. His amazing side yard, which he turned into a little barley field. Uh, and he also has lots of containers with hops and such. So, uh, in addition to getting a preview of the upcoming BYO issue, I wanted to get an update on Chris's agricultural efforts. Well, Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on. I want to talk about, uh, and I'm, it's a tempest here in Prairie Grove, Arkansas. We're, a thunderstorm is just passing over, so if you hear rumbling in the background, that's not my stomach. That's uh, Mother Nature. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to talk about uh, a few things today. First off, uh, this Friday is the deadline for our uh, brew your own uh, basic brewing radio collaborative experiment, and we've got uh, we've heard from three continents so far, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from uh, the rest of the brewers out there who are taking part in the experiments. And I don't want to spoil, you know, I don't want this to be a spoiler. I don't want to talk about the results, but uh, 
we've gotten some interesting data from the people who have been writing in. Mm-hmm, definitely. So we look forward to that. And in a couple of weeks, I hope to uh, to do a show on it, and I'll be sending you some beers probably today uh, if I don't get blown away by this storm. And then, uh, then we can do a show and talk about the results, and then uh, hopefully we can see it published in the magazine. Sure. Yes. We've got it slotted in already. Excellent. Well, uh, first off, I want to talk about the, the article that you were talking the, 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 you suggested in uh, this upcoming issue of Brew Your Own, but you've been busy in the garden. Yeah, I have. I uh, we did the show a while back on the uh, on my barley field or whatever the video segment, mm-hmm. and since that time, I've harvested the barley and I've uh, threshed it. Um, on harvest day, I had a, a buddy of mine, John Brack from uh, JB from Austin Homebrew, came out and we uh, we both took really big knives and uh we uh just went through the the uh the barley you know grabbed a bunch of heads at once sort of held them together and used the knife to uh to cut you know through the straw and collected all that and took not too long uh really sort of an afternoon and you know and we we had a couple beer breaks and uh you got to do that and we harvested a uh a whole wheelbarrow full of uh, barley and four uh, kitty litter uh, containers full of barley, which <laughs> I realize these aren't standard measures of uh, <laughs> agricultural output, but uh, it's, it's what I had on hand. <laughs> now, now, how close to the uh, to the bushel is a kitty litter uh, uh, bucket? I, I have no idea. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. So you used a pretty low tech method of uh, harvesting. Uh, yep. You just slashed it off at the at the base there. Yeah, no, not at the base. We uh we sort of tried to grab you know um, a bunch of plants at once and just hold it, sort of hold it right by the uh, you know where the head turns into the uh, uh or or you know the straw turns into the head. And then cut, you know, so there was as little straw with it as possible, um, just because you know we I needed to separate it all later, and yeah, that's what we did. Just uh, our first, we started off on a towards the top of the garden, and that first little ten foot by ten foot block took us about twenty two minutes, something like that, to do, and then we uh, the later blocks took a little longer, uh, just because uh, you know we didn't. Yeah, we uh, we took a couple breaks and we were just sort of, you know, goofing around <laughs> some of the time. But uh, you know, it was, losing your enthusiasm for the task at hand. Or... <laughs> no, nah, it wasn't really that. It was just you know we started joking around about stuff and you know you're, you're two guys running around with these huge knives in your front yard. You're bound to make some jokes, uh, <laughs> scare scare the neighbors. I'm sure they were like, well, "What in the hell?" <laughs> so uh, so did it go as as you thought it would? Pretty much, I was I was a little surprised it went that fast. I, uh, I I somehow thought it might take just a little bit longer, but uh, it went it went pretty quickly, and we were pretty thorough. There, about the only you know barley left standing was stuff that we had uh, said we weren't going to cut down. There were a few little patches where there uh, the barley was still green, and we just said you know just leave those for now. And um, yeah, it went it. It was uh, it went fairly straightforward, given that that was the first time. So, how long ago was that, and have you taken the next step yet? Yeah, that was just a few weeks ago, and yeah, I've I've taken the next step, which is threshing the barley. Um, what I, what I've done to do that threshing is just you you basically get the heads uh, on the barley to uh, shatter, and you remove the straw. Um, and what I did for that was I just had, uh, you know, I had like three or four kitty litter containers in a row and I would just pull some straw from one or, or, you know, some, some barley and just with just some work gloves, just like crush it in my hand and sort of, you know, roll it back and forth and that would break up the heads and those would drop in the bucket. And then, you know, from there, pull out the straw and just kind of keep, you know, in a, in a conveyor belt fashion doing that. And eventually, you know, you get, um, at the end, you get, you know, a uh, uh, container that's just full of straw, and uh, the other containers have, you know, um, 
uh, the broken up pieces of the heads in them, and and that's where I am right now. I've got I've got a ten gallon uh, uh, ten gallon um, brute uh, garbage can full of plant material that's just from the heads, just the uh, the spikelets and the and the kernels. And so my next uh, the next step will be winnowing it, which is you know removing all that plant material from the uh, the kernels, and that all uh, just need to wait sort of for a windy day for that, and uh, sort of pour the uh, pour all the stuff from one container to another a few times and let the wind carry away the uh, the little spiky parts which are very light and let you know the the kernels which are heavier will fall, you know pretty much not be affected by the wind. So you've got basically ten gallons in volume of of just stuff from the heads. Yeah. So how, what percentage of that is grain and what percentage is chaff, do you think? I'm not sure. That's a really good question. We On harvest day, we sort of tried to eyeball it and guessed that we maybe had six to seven pounds worth of malt or, yeah, or six to seven pounds worth of barley, you know, just the kernels. And I would say that was a pretty good guess right now because the, uh, you know, the head material, there's a lot of – the spikes really take up a lot of space. And so right now there's – uh, you know, there's quite a bit of uh, that fluffy, uh, you know, when, once it's all broke up, it's just kind of a fluffy, sticky, you know, kind of stuff. Um, or stick-like, not sticky, mm-hmm. uh, not like tacky. But, uh, yeah, I, I would say there's probably at, at the bottom of that uh, thing, there's probably, six, you know, six to seven pounds, and the rest of it's just sort of the uh, remaining material. But uh, I, I could be way off. I could be... You know, it could be more, it could be less right now. Still, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's funny. It's hard to tell. You would think that at some point you would be getting a clearer picture of how much you have, but I really think it's going to take until I winnowed it to know, to have any sort of reasonable guess, because once I winnow it, then I've got to separate, or I've got to grade the kernels out, because uh, there are kernels that are, you know, they, they come from full-size plants that grew and, and filled, you know, the right amount. And then there are all, all sorts of kernels for, you know, for whatever reason, aren't aren't as as plump as the others. And the, you know that can be from, you know, on a healthy plant, there's you know several full size, and there might be a few smaller ones. And and on you know sort of undersized plants, of course, they sometimes would grow if they if they set too many kernels, the, the, all the kernels would be small. Wow. And so you know, it's once I get a weight of how much kernels I have total, I can probably you know, look through there and just try to guesstimate like what percentage of the the kernels are going to be big enough to malt. Because I'm I'm guessing right now I'll probably be accepting some kernels that are a little bit smaller than than you normally would for a you know like a commercial malting. Um, but then again, I don't know. Maybe maybe I have because I, I know I've got a bunch of full size kernels in there somewhere. But so, so how but how do you how do you grade them? How do you separate them out? Um, that's a good question. I need, uh, started to go to a hardware store and look for some sort of screens or something slotted or, you know, something that I can, uh, put the kernels in and shake and have the smaller ones fall through the bottom and have the the larger ones retained. Wow. Um, I haven't quite figured out what that's going to be yet. Wow. But I think a, a quick trip to the hardware store, I can probably look at a variety of different you know, screens or uh, any kind of slotted thing might work. So in addition to uh, doing a base malt, are you going to try any, you know, specialty grains or or roasting different levels? I'm probably going to malt it all as sort of a Vienna malt kind of thing, or you might want to think of it as a pale ale malt kind of thing, you know, somewhere in in a a base malt in the three to four Lava Bond region. Um, I'm doing that because, well, for one reason, I, I tend to like those kind of base malts. You know, uh, uh, you know, three love a bond is is right around where a lot of uh, sort of English pale ale malts are roasted. A little bit darker than that, and it's Vienna malts. Uh, I like those malts, and also I think a little darker. There's a little more room for uh, uh, room for error. You mm-hmm. know, if I go if I go over a little bit. It's, you know, so it turns into a Munich. That's not a big deal. And if I'm under a little, well, then it's just a plain pale malt. So, um, 
because I, I, right now I have no idea how, like how fiddly the roasting is going to be if you you know if you can just put it in at, the, at a time and temperature and have it turn out right or if or if it's sort of a more of a you know gamble or you know uh, quirky thing. So I picked a you know moderately uh, kilned uh, you know base malt just to try to you know hedge my bets there a little bit. Well, it's exciting. I can't uh, can't wait to see how it uh, how it turns out. Yeah, we're, I'm going to use. Half of it, and I'm going to try to make like a Vienna Lager type beer, assuming the uh, the the malt turns out, you know, roughly that color. And I'm going to use the other half. And I think this is assuming that we have enough to do it. I have enough to do it, and I'm going to make um, another batch of my. Uh, I brewed recently um, an ancient Sumerian beer clone that we uh, in the magazine a while back we had published the recipe for it. And a buddy of mine, Joe Walton, and I brewed this beer that's uh, you b- you bake the bread and you mash the bread and the malt together and then you uh, add some honey to the wort and then you take some uh, spontaneously fermented uh, fruit wine and use that as the uh, the pitching yeast. Hmm. And uh, we did it. We didn't spontaneously ferment the uh, the fruit wine. I-, I mashed up some dates and some grapes and I poured in a uh, um, a Flanders red. Uh, so it had so it had a mixture of beer yeast and uh, souring microorganisms in it, and uh, we yeah we recently tasted that at a zealots meeting, and it turned out uh, that the ancient Sumerians actually knew something about brewing beer because it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. You've also got a, an experiment going in your uh, in your yard for hops. I do. I've been growing hops for a number of years down here, and. Um, I live in Texas, and uh, my experience and, and the experience of other Texas hop growers is, you know, it's it's really fun to grow them. You know, they're nice decorative plants, but the, uh, the the cones you get down here, the quality just isn't good. And specifically, they usually are very grassy. Um, you, you know, you just sort of uh, in in commercial ones, that's a fault, and you and you might get a little whiff of grassiness in some hops that aren't up to par. But down here. Like you smell them and you're just like, whoa, that's grassy, you hmm. know. Um, and so I came up with the hypothesis that perhaps the reason for that is if you, you know, if you just let your hops grow up and you train them to the wires and let them grow here, um, as you've had experience with, they come due in, uh, you know, it can be midway through July or, or early August and you're already harvesting hops, mm-hmm. some, sometimes even earlier. And of course, it's just bloody hot down here at that time. <laughs> and uh, you know, it can be you know, it can be over a hundred every day for you know the majority of the time that your hop cones are maturing. And so I wondered if the grassiness had something to do with with the heat. Um, you know, a lot of if you are a vegetable gardener, you know, there are a lot of different vegetables that they say you know this this tastes better if it you know uh, like watermelons you want to grow hot. Uh, other other um, vegetables, if it's too hot, that you know they pick up different off flavors or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I wondered if there was, you know, it was a temperature dependent something that because this the 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 character of, of grassiness it is sort of very persistent down here. So I hit on the idea of well, why don't I make them the cones uh, mature at a different time of the year? Hmm. And how to do that? Um, I thought uh, and. and my experiment will show if it works this year, is let them grow up for a while and then just cut them back to the ground sort of uh, in in the somewhat early season and so then let them start over and they'll grow and hopefully they won't, um, you know, they won't sort of just catch up with the, the other hops. Hopefully they'll be delayed and start producing cones and try, I'm trying to get the cones to uh, be harvestable in like late September. Ah. And so, anyway, I, I started the experiment. I've got a number of container hops uh, out there. I split uh, four rhizomes last year, so I've got four pairs of uh, hops growing of different varieties, uh, Northern Brewer, Centennial, Chinook, and Nugget, that are grown from a split rhizome. So, so they're, the, you know, they're the same variety of hop. They're grown from the same split rhizome mm-hmm. growing side by side. And I've also got two cascades. Uh, they're they're not from the same rhizome, but they're at least the same variety growing side by side. And I waited till May 
I was going to do it May 1st, but I did it May 2nd. I waited until May, uh, early May, and cut back uh, the growth on half of those. So I had, you know, I had maybe eight feet of growth on a lot of these uh, that, you know, they, they sprang up early, like as, as early as late February, and they were just, you know, they're, they're getting good sun and they were growing well. And I cut them all back. And that was, you know, a couple weeks ago now. And all of them but one have, have re-sprouted and are growing. Uh, and I assume the other one's going to sprout and come back. I, w- I was watering it the other day, and I noticed this, like, huge grub comes like, as I'm watering it and soaking it, this huge grub like crawls out of the uh, <laughs> the growth mix, and and I was like, ah, Jesus! It's probably they're chewing on the roots and all that. Um, so that that grub is no more. And uh, but anyway, I'm about I'm about to the point where I'm gonna uh, trellis them again. They're they're definitely the the ones that have resprouted have got to that point where I can work them onto the wires again. And I'll be, you know, following the experiment on my blog. And, you know, I think sort of the early thing I'm looking for is that when when the early hops start to flower, I'll, I want to see that the late hops don't flower with them, that they don't just, you know, they haven't just regrown. And if, if it's some sort of, you know, uh, seasonal thing where they're, they're going to flower simultaneously, I'll hope to see that the ones I left alone will flower first. And then hope to see the uh, other ones flower second, and then of course I hope to see that, you know, when the the ones I left alone will, you know, they'll get done whenever they're done, July, August, or whatever. You know, I hope to see that the other ones come due in September, uh, and then you know finally I, I'll hope that when I, uh, you know, smell the hops side by side and brew side by side with them that the, there's actually improved uh, quality of, of hops, and I. I sort of think it's going to work because I uh, uh, had sort of an accidental experiment last year with uh, so a little pruning accident led to uh, one plant being cut back, you know, sort of late in the season, and it and it grew up and it it produced uh, hop cones later than the rest of them, and, and I, I thought that the those the ones I harvested late were of a lot better character. They seemed like markedly less grassy. Huh. That's interesting because I, I sort of did um, something similar uh, again accidentally. Uh, I in the at the first part of the year I was pretty good at pruning back uh, all the volunteer um, vines coming in late and just kept the cascade hops uh, to like five or six main vines going up. Uh, and once they produced, you know, I picked like two and a half pounds of wet hops uh, that, that first harvest. I just said, ah, what the heck, I'll just let it go. Um, partially out of uh, laziness and because it was so darn hot outside. So I just let it go and I got a second harvest. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't label which ones were which. So that, that would be interesting to to see the difference between those two. So, Yeah, yeah. and that, that that's actually not uncommon with... I've seen that in the South too. People with, especially if you get a, a very early sort of crop early, um, if you just leave the vines alone, they'll they'll put in a second one, and and that'd be kind of interesting too. I mean, if that happens to me this year, I'll I'll label those too, and maybe you know maybe you don't need to cut them back at all. Maybe you just need to harvest the first batch and you know throw them on the compost heap and and you know let the second batch come. Uh, so that'll be. That'll be an interesting potential uh, sub experiment. Cool. Well, let's. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, the third is an article that you sent me on corking Belgian beers. And uh, now we, you know, on the wine side, we talk about corking a bunch, but uh, not so much on the beer side. Um, was this an article that you wrote? No, this is an article by a guy named uh, Dave Liu. And he had uh, uh, he'd been getting into as as a lot of homebrewers are recently into uh, you know Belgian beers and he sort of um, you know he noticed that to him these you know he sort of thought the presentation of Belgian bottles with the corks and the cages was nice and he wanted to you know uh, be able to present his homebrew that way so he he wrote up this uh, uh, you know sh- fairly short article but uh, you know I think people who 
you know, uh, enjoy Belgian beers and, and would like to, to bottle their, their beers, this is a good informative uh, article. Now, what do you need? Is uh, Will just any corker do? Um, you, you're not going to be able to use those the little, you know, the wing ones, the, the two-handed. Uh, you're going to need either a, like a floor-standing corker or what he uses is called a Kelowna corker. Uh, it looks like a... It's hard, hard to describe. So it's sort of like a half half shell or whatever, and the bottle fits inside it. And you can you can raise or lower a little uh, stage at the bottom to you know to, to adjust how high the bottle sits in the in the corker. And then there, there's a lever on top that that you move, and that uh, you sort of need that because you need a decent amount of leverage to get these uh, uh, the Belgian corks in. And you need Belgian style beer bottles, uh, you know ones that uh, are going to be able to take the the pressure exerted on them by the the uh, you know the capper, and you know so ones that are going to are the right size for the the corks. And beyond that, you need the Belgian corks and the wire hoods to hold them in. Yeah, what's the difference between a, a Belgian cork and say a champagne cork? You know, I'm not uh, incredibly sure. Like I'm, I'm, it's probably made out of the same cork material, but just different size. I'm guessing. That, that's something I actually don't know. Um, an interesting thing about those corks, though, is like when you pull a cork out of a Belgian bottle, it looks like a little mushroom. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got the narrow spot and the uh, thick spot. Well, they come actually as just cylinders. Huh. It's the uh, you, in the corking, you actually have to force that uh, cork into the bottle, and then it the sort of pressure of the the cork holds it and it makes it into the little mushroom shaped. Now, in our experience with uh, on the wine side, uh, we've discovered that uh, it, it kind of pays to get a good corker. Uh, we tried playing with a couple of cheap ones, and then we tried, uh, you know, the, the big stand one. We didn't try the Kelowna uh, corker, but we found that for your sanity and for ease of use, uh, it pays to, to spend a little money on a corker. Yeah, I would... I would concur. I mean, especially if you are becoming someone who who makes a lot of Belgian beers and you're going to do this a lot, you probably are going to save money in the long run just buying something that, that works, you know, well to start with rather than starting with something inadequate and, you know, uh, later on scaling up. So first off, you, you've got to adjust your corker. You don't want, you don't want to set the corker to where it corks like an ordinary wine bottle and goes all the way in the bottle, right? Right, because you, 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 you have the cork, and, and it's you know thicker than the uh, diameter of the bottle, which, you know, in wine ones, they're, they're just, you know, pretty much uh, just very slightly larger than the opening. And, and the Belgian ones, they're, you know, demonstrably larger than the opening. And so you want to, you adjust the, the base of it so that when you push the handle the full way, you've only inserted the cork uh, part of the way into the bottle, and you want to leave, you know, the little bit uh, of corks sitting on the outside, the part that becomes like, you know, the cap of the mushroom. So yeah, you just, uh, you adjust the bottom uh, so that so that you got the right, you know, the right length of uh, sort of throw, if you want to think about it that way, uh, on the, the corker, that when you're done pushing it in, you've still got uh, some cork hanging out of the bottle. And the uh, he's got steps here for us. Number one, adjusting mm. the corker. Number two, filling the bottle, which is important. Right. Yeah. Uh, you, and you can, you know, most people, if they're doing Belgians, are going to have, you know, it's a, a mix of beer and priming sugar. Uh, although you could, if you, you know, had carbonated beer, you could put carbonated beer in there and, and cap it quickly without too much loss. But part of the charm of Belgians is having a, a higher carbonated uh, beverage. Yeah, I think most people will, would bottle condition it. Uh, then there's uh, inserting the cork itself, and you want to sanitize these, right? Right. Um, and also uh, a little bit of uh, liquid makes them slide in the bottle easier, too. They're not uh, as uh, sort of tacky or sticky. Um, so the way he does it is just prepare a little bar- bowl of star sand solution, uh, you know, and... Uh, soak the corks in that briefly and then use them to cork the bowl. Um, he uses star sand because 
you know, if you used, like, bleach or whatever, then you'd have, you know, the cork would smell like bleach, and that would contaminate your beer. Hmm. Likewise, you know, iodophore, which is a great sanitizer for, for beer, you don't want that iodophore, you know, flavor or color in your beer. And, you know, I guess you could also try to, to boil your corks, but that's, you know, that's just going to disintegrate them. Yeah. So, so star sand is a good... Uh, uh, a, a good um, sanitizer to use here. And the interesting thing about trying to sanitize corks is they float, so you can. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you you know if you tried to boil them anyway, they just bounce around on top of the water. So <laughs> uh, that would that would be challenging in itself. Yeah, you could probably just do this step with water too. I mean, I know that. You know, at wineries, they don't sanitize their corks, and I would sort of doubt that they sanitize them at Belgian breweries, but you never know. I mean, a little, a little bit of star sand is, you know, just as a preventative measure is not a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, now, he says the tricky part is um, is after you've uh, punched the cork into the bottle. you got to kind of work, your, work the bottle and the cork out of the corker since uh, part of it's still stuck in there. Right. This uh, at at the top of the corker, there's like a little funnel that you know starts out at the size of the cork and ends up at you know the size of the bottle. And you're pushing down on that, which which squishes the cork so it can get in the the bottle. And then once you've once you've reached the, the total throw, you know as far as the uh, um, as far as the leverage is going to take you and, and it's stopped, you've still got the top of the cork is still wedged in that funnel thing. So what you need to do then is uh, sort of readjust the base of it, um, you know, take out the uh, uh, little stage that's holding the bottle, or if you have one that, that you know, adjusts by uh, turning a lever or something, turn that down, then just hold the bottle with your hand and push the uh, push the lever, you know, the rest of the way now that you've freed up extra space on the bottom and have that push the cork through. It's kind of opposite from, from what you try to do ordinarily with wine because uh, – on some of these cheaper uh, corkers, we found that we accidentally did this technique. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's easy to mess up and have uh, you know part of the cork sticking out of the top there, and you get the little mushroom shape when you don't want it. So it takes a little practice. Um, and then, because you're you're going to be uh, building up some pressure in the bottle, uh, you don't. It's not like a bottle cap, which is crimped on. It's a it's a cork. And you got to make sure that the cork doesn't pop itself, right? Right, and and you know especially because you've at least in the beginning you've sanitized it with star sand, and it's going to take a little while for that to dry, sort of in contact. So it's going to you know it's going to be slippery and has pressure against it. So the you know the the wire hoods or whatever are not just uh, you know they're, they're nice looking presentation wise, but they they serve the the function also of you know, making sure that the you know the cork doesn't blast off at, at the at the wrong time, and to do those, uh, they actually have uh, there are special tighteners for that that you can buy at a wine shop, but you can just as easily put the hood over there and just take a like a a pencil and hold it uh, the uh, edge of the the wire and then just sort of twist it around. Mm-hmm. And uh, he recommends it in the uh, articles when you twist, sort of pull the uh, pull the pencil or the twister away from the bottle and hold it with a little bit of tension, and then there you'll get a nice sort of even uh, loop. And uh, you know, turn it enough times that it's going to hold, but don't you know you don't get any points for uh, you know wrapping it a million times. You know, you're just going to have to unwrap it when you uh, <laughs> open the bottle. And um, that's about it. And you want, you he, want to store these on the side like like regular champagne, right? Yeah. Once you, once you've got a, a corked bottle, uh, yeah, you're, you're best storing it on the on its side so that the beer uh, is touching the cork, keeping it uh, you know inflated and um, uh, uh, wet, and so so that the uh, if you store them upright, the the corks can eventually dry out, and you start getting a lot of air coming into the bottle that you don't want. Mm. Mm. And you could have corked beer in the same way that you would have corked wine. Yeah, you could. Well, that sounds like fun, and it's easy to do if you've got the right tools. Yeah, it looks cool. I've I've actually never uh, bottled a Belgian-style 
beer with with uh, the Belgian stuff. But uh, yeah, I think I you know next time I I make you know spend a lot of time and effort making a big Belgian something, I might try this out. Well, cool. Well, uh, we will be talking to you in a couple of weeks, going over the uh, uh, our little collaborative experiment. And again, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to more data coming in. And until then, we will be keeping track of your progress on the blog, which is at byo.com. Yeah, it's uh, actually right on the front page, um, and you can uh, you can click on the most recent blog by me and the most recent blog by John Palmer is right there. And you can also just go across the menu on top and click, click blogs, and uh, it'll pull up all of them. You know, so if you uh, you know missed one or something. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Chris. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, thanks again to Chris Colby. It's always fun to talk to Chris, even in the middle of a thunderstorm. (laughs) Most of the lightning was gone (laughs) by the time we were talking. If you click on the uh, BYO banner ad on basicbrewing.com, you can get a free issue of the magazine. And if you decide to subscribe after reading that issue, you'll be helping to support this podcast. And as usual, we appreciate everybody who's done so. Remember, we got Brewer's Logbooks and our new Basic Winemaking Introduction to Wine Kits DVD out on our online store. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check your email address to make sure that uh, make sure that we can get back to you. Check out our other DVDs, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing DVD on uh, basicbrewingshop.com. Also, Stepping into All Grain and Introduction to Extract Home Brewing as well. And uh, on our site, you can get combo deals, and you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it from us online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Support your local homebrew shop uh, and us. We also have shirts of uh, different different colors, shirts of many colors. N- not in each shirt, but you know, each shirt's one color, but we get different. You know, you know what I mean. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Grace Wi-Fi Radio GDIIR2000 with remote and aux in jack, which is pretty cool. I like the looks of that. Uh, also, Gore Bikewear Motion Full Zip Cycling Jersey, short sleeve men's. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we appreciate your support. And don't forget also the American Homebrewers Association link, in addition to the BYO link, so you can become a member of the American Homebrewers Association and support us at the same time. That's all. Until next week, until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.